Hey everybody, I'm Will Martin, and today we're going to talk about a New York Times article that came across my desk on February 5th, and it's entitled, Doctors Aren't Burned Out from Overwork, We're Demoralized by Our Health System. Now, the title sounded intriguing to me, so I started to read it, and I got uh, two paragraphs into it, and we started talking about universal health care. I stopped reading at that point. I thought, here's another attempt to try to persuade me and others that universal health care is where we should be. And I have an opinion on it, just uh, like I'm sure you do. And I'd love to hear your opinions on universal health care, especially those of you that live in a country that has universal health care, like the UK or Canada or other places. But this is my opinion. First of all, I know that our system is broken. I, I know our system is crappy. And I hate saying that our system is broken because what does that really mean? Anyway, I said it and, and I now I regret saying it. But my point is that I have pretty good health insurance as far as I know. I'm fortunate. I mean, I work for an employer where uh, I have a health care plan that I don't have a large, I don't have any deductible. I have... Uh, Copays, but I don't have any deductible. Uh, up until now, I haven't really had to use it other than for primary care visits, but I've got some issues that are coming up now and I'm going to start using it. So I guess we'll find out what kind of health insurance I really do have. But in any case, I've always felt that universal health care, if you're, if you're from Canada or you're from the UK, I mean, generally, this is what I hear is that there's a lot of... Um, that there's a lot of disappointment with with those systems. And again, if you're from one of those countries, uh, please comment and, and you know, let me know what, what you think about it. But my feeling is this, that if you can match what I have in a universal health care plan, then let's do it. Let's give it to everybody. And of course, it's going to cost trillions of dollars, but it seems as though we can spend billions of dollars sending money here, there, and everywhere so why not put a little bit of money into our health care system that would at least match what I have? What I think would happen and what would happen is if you went to some sort of universal health care, then you would have a whole bunch of people at the top that would lose benefits and you'd have a whole bunch of people at the bottom that would gain benefits and we would somehow meet in the middle. In other words, we would have mediocre health care coverage. And I don't know if that's the answer. I don't think it is, at least from my perspective, it's not. I want to have the best. I want to have everything covered. And I want to pay as little as possible for it. I, I think that that's just normal to, to feel that way. So anyway, I did sit down and read this essay eventually because I thought, okay, maybe there's, maybe there's more to it. I'm not going to prejudge it too much. So I'm going to share it with you here, okay? And uh, let me just click over to it. Okay, uh, and again, it's, it's entitled, Doctors Aren't Burned Out from Overwork. We're Demoralized by Our Health System. The uh, essay author is Eric Reinhardt. He's a physician, and he's also a political anthropologist, and I had to look that up, and I still don't know for sure what a political anthropologist is, but you can Google it. And I'll put the link to the uh, article below so that you can read this yourself. Don't take my word for it as far as what's in here. Uh, the author is a, a physician at Northwestern University. He's also a psychoanalyst and, uh, again, political anthropologist. Anyway, uh, what he says is that we have, uh, as uh, healthcare providers, we have a long history of diagnosing demoralization syndrome. That's another syndrome that I never heard of, but anyway, uh, essentially what it is is uh, uh, people that are like in, in a terminal condition just feel demoralized. They're hopeless. They're helpless. Uh, and, and, you know, they kind of give up. So what he's saying is that American physicians suffer from a similar condition, but it's not from the illness. It's uh, rather from a diseased healthcare system. OK, so far, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I can buy that. I think that our healthcare system has a lot of weakness to it. It also has a lot of strengths, and I think when you compare it with other countries, I think that we have a pretty good healthcare system. 
I mean, here's here's a point that I'll make right off the bat. I work in emergency medicine. I work in the emergency department. I, I work in two different emergency departments under the same system, under the same hospital. One is more of a community hospital setting. The other one is a level one trauma center, tertiary care, academic medical center, and uh, it's an inner city setting. So in both of those situations, the waiting room is filled with people pretty much around the clock. The wait times can be just exorbitant, 8, 10, 12 hours or more. And it, that's ridiculous in and of itself. And if you want to talk about a, a diseased healthcare system, there's the biggest symptom of it right there is if the front door to the hospital has a wait time of 8, 10, or 12 hours, then there's something wrong with the system. But anyway, my point is that we have poor and indigent people in that waiting room. I, I mean, most of the waiting room, that's what it's comprised of is, is poor people. And they're all being taken care of. Yes, they're waiting a long time, and I, I feel horrible about that. But you know what? If they need a CAT scan, they get a CAT scan. If they need an ultrasound, they get an ultrasound. Whatever lab work they need, they get it done. If they need a, a, an emergency consultation with ear, nose, and throat, or neurology, or dental, or anybody, they get it. They get it right in the emergency department. They're getting the care. And, of course, if they don't have any money to pay for it, you can't get blood from a stone. So, I mean, ultimately, yes, they may be sent a bill, but they're not going to pay it. And I think everyone understands that. Now, that's our system. That's the way our system works, good or bad. If you get some universal health coverage, I guarantee you it still won't cover all of that stuff that we're doing. I mean, when somebody comes in with belly pain, for example, intuitively, you could probably say, yeah, this is probably nothing. But you don't know. And that's not how we practice emergency medicine. You have to do a physical exam. You have to use some clinical gestalt. And ultimately, to stay out of the uh, witness stand, you probably are going to do some blood work and maybe some imaging. And that's all going to cost money. That's just the way the system is. So things can definitely be improved. That's for sure. Uh, but uh, let's go back to the article here. So what the author says is that the U.S. is the only large nation that doesn't provide universal health care for its citizens. Okay. Instead, it maintains a lucrative system of for-profit medicine. I, I mean, lucrative, it's, it's probably lucrative for somebody, but it's not lucrative for me as a nurse practitioner. It's not lucrative for the nurses. And that's one of the reasons why we lost so many nurses over the last couple of years. It wasn't because they all got fired because they wouldn't get a COVID vaccine. We did lose quite a few because of that. But a lot of them just decided, you know what, for, for the money that you're paying me, I'm not going to be here at, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning. Instead, I'm going to go get some job working in an outpatient surgery center, making essentially the same amount of money with the same benefits, and I'm going to be 9 to 5 Monday through Friday, and I'm going to have a good work-life balance. So that is uh, the way it is. And I mean, if you paid nurses more, you probably would get more nurses to stay. But they're not. I mean, there were all kinds of promises that were made, uh, you know. But th the reality is we have, um, <clears throat> we have traveling nurses that were making 100 bucks an hour uh, during COVID. And then that became a big news bite. And subsequently, they all got their, their pay slashed. But that pay, I think, is creeping back up again. And if anybody is a traveling nurse listening to this, let me know uh, if that's true. But from what I understand, the, the pay is starting to go back up again for traveling nurses. And we have a ton of traveling nurses at my hospital. I know that for sure. Um, so anyway, um, the author says that uh, for decades, at least tens of thousands of preventable deaths have occurred each year because healthcare is so expensive. I'll take him at his word. You know, I just don't have any data to, to refute it. Um, but then again, he's not providing any data to support it either. 
And also along the same vein, uh, during COVID, things got worse. One study estimates 338,000 COVID deaths in the U.S. could have been prevented by universal health care. I, I don't know if that's true or not. Again, I'm just basically just repeating what this author said. I don't have the data points to, uh, to really refute it. Then it goes on to say many healthcare workers have been left shaken. And this is something that irritates me a little bit too, because I think when you get into healthcare, you have to know that you're going to be taking care of people and people get sick and people die and horrible things happen to people. It's like when you uh, decide that you're going to be a cop or a firefighter or a paramedic. You're not going into it to not see bad things. You're going into it knowing that you will see bad things and you will see bad things on a daily basis. And you probably will see someone die probably every day of your career. And the same thing goes for certain parts of healthcare. If you work in the emergency department or if you work in an intensive care unit, you probably will see someone die every day, every day of your career. If you're going to work 20 or 30 years, uh, you can probably bank on seeing hundreds, if not thousands of people die, in some cases, horrible deaths. This is the way it is. And I don't think that nursing schools, for example, are really educating nurses that this is what you're going to see when you graduate. Um, it's not all about wearing figs and having, you know, nice form fitting scrubs and you know, having a nice fancy bag and this is what's in my bag. I got my, my nice stethoscope and all this kind of stuff. No, it's going to be very tough work, dirty work. And uh, I, I don't think we're, we're getting people prepared for that. I think by the same token, I think a lot of physicians that go into training, I, I don't think are going into it really understanding what they're going to get into. Um, I think some, you know, go into healthcare, go into medicine because dad was a doctor, mom was a doctor, or uncle Joe was a doctor and they're kind of a legacy. And so they're, they're going into medicine for the same reason. And I think they find out that number one, they're not going to make the same amount of money that uncle Joe did, uh, because, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day and you're only physically able to see X number of patients in those 24 hours. And Health insurance and Medicare has already put a cap on how much you're going to earn. So earning potential that was much higher back in the day because physicians could pretty much charge whatever they wanted and they got paid. Uh, that's not the case. And every year reimbursement gets lower and lower. So you can see I go off on a bunch of tangents here when it comes to this sort of thing. Uh, the author says that 117,000 physicians left the workforce while fewer than 40,000 joined it. This was during COVID. Um, I believe it. I, I know that, like I said, a lot of nurses left, and I think a lot of physicians decided that uh, it wasn't worth it. They went into other areas to earn money, and a lot of physicians can go into a lot of things outside the hospital. I mean, consulting and working for insurance companies and other things like that. I mean, there's tons of ways to earn an income without having to slog it out at the bedside. What's a shame is that you went to school for that. You took a slot in a medical school program. You took a slot in a residency program that maybe somebody else would have taken and may have stayed in medicine for a longer period of time. But that's just the way it is. You know, a lot of people get in. Um, and, and I hear this amongst our, our younger residents. I hear all the time. They'll, they'll look at me. I mean, I'm the white haired guy. There's not a lot of white haired guys working in the emergency department today. But they'll look at me and they'll say, uh, Will, I definitely don't want to be here when I'm your age. <laughs> I hear that a lot. Now, of course, you know, you could scream ageism, you know, I, I'm, I feel, you know, attacked, whatever. But I get what they're saying. They don't want to be working here. They, they figure that by the time they turn 45 or 50, they should be well on their way to retirement and sitting on a beach somewhere. And, you know, God bless. I hope they do. I hope they can do that. But the way that the system is, is being set up, I don't think, I don't think that they're going to realize that. But uh, maybe they will. Maybe they will. Um, it's, uh, the author said that one in five doctors plans to leave medical practice in the coming years. Well, 
I, again, this is what I'm talking about. I think a lot of these younger physicians are planning on getting out. And I've said this before, too, as far as nurses, a lot of nurses will work a year or two. And then they're out. They're out the door because they're either they're going to find something else that uh, provides better work life balance. Or they just decided that, you know, it isn't really for them. I mean, there was one nurse that I worked with that uh, she also had her cosmetology license. And she decided after a couple of years of being a nurse in the emergency department that she was just going to um, go some other route. She used her cosmetology license to do hair. Then she got into the esthetician thing, doing Botox and fillers and, and all that other stuff. And, and I, she's making a pretty good living right now. She's working for a nurse practitioner that opened up a practice doing just that. And, and I think they're making gobs of money. Um, to, to each their own. That's that's good. See, to me, I couldn't be the guy that's putting Botox into somebody and then, you know, a week later they come back to me screaming because, you know, the side of their face is all deformed or whatever. <laughs> I, I don't need that kind of stress, you know. So, okay, so the author says, is burnout the cause or is it diminished faith in the healthcare system? He also postulates, is this the result of a crisis of ideology, political, cultural, or moral narratives? So uh, throughout this article, he will occasionally get a little political. And I can tell that I, I think he's got a little bit more of a, you know, socialized, communist type bent to him. And I think you'll see that as we move on a little bit more. Um, but he said that hospitals nearly fell apart during the pandemic uh, due to underinvestments in the public health systems, uneven distribution of the medical infrastructure, and inequalities in the standard of care available to rich and poor Americans. I think that he's got a, a good point on, on a couple of these uh, areas here. First of all, underinvestment in public health systems. I think that uh, we have not done a good job in uh, working on primary care systems. I've gone back, you know, the beginning of my career and, and even before that. I mean, I can tell you my first job, I, my first job as a nurse practitioner was working in a medical intensive care unit at a medium sized hospital. And we didn't have intensivists. We didn't have physicians that were in the ICU 24 hours a day. We had nurse practitioners that were in the ICU 24 hours a day. The attending physicians were, in many cases, primary care docs that worked in their office from 9 to 5. And then after 5 p.m., they came to the hospital and they rounded on their patients, both on the floor and in the ICU. They would meet with me. We would talk about what went on during the day. We would come up with a plan for the nighttime, and then they would go home, and I would be there to carry out the plan. Same thing in the morning. A lot of them would come in before office hours and round on their patients. These are primary care doctors. These are family practice docs. Also, uh, nephrologists and urologists, cardiologists, uh, they all came and rounded on their patients. Um, and, and even back then, we didn't have hospitalists in the hospital. I mean, there was no, no nocturnists, no hospitalists. And for those of you who don't know, a nocturnist is a physician that just works at night in the hospital. And a hospitalist is a doctor that just works in the hospital. He doesn't have a practice or she doesn't have a practice outside the hospital. It's just within the hospital system. And a lot of people don't understand, even to this day, when they come into the emergency department and they say, my doctor is Dr. So-and-so, are you going to call him and is he going to see me in the hospital? And we're going to say, no, it just doesn't work that way anymore. Unfortunately, your doctor won't see you. Your doctor will get a report on what we do to you, but you're, you're not going to be seen by your doctor while you're here. And a lot of older folks really are, are surprised by that, but uh, that is in my mind, part of the erosion of the healthcare system. It, it was a much better system when your own doctor came and saw you. They knew you. Um, but think about what, what the work-life balance was like for those people back in those days. I mean, they, I, I, knew, I knew docs that would come in at 5 o'clock in the morning, round on their patients, 
and it would take them two hours to round. And then they get back to their office around 7.30 and they might have an hour to, you know, write some notes and chart and then bang, they're off to see patients in their office from nine to five, pretty much nonstop. They'd be lucky if they got a lunch. And then at five o'clock, they're back to the hospital rounding on patients again. And so they're home at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And that was every day of the week. And, and some of them would have to take turns with call. So, you know, working as a physician back then, I always looked at it as like being a priest or, or you know, being, uh, you know, something in the, in, in, the, in the clergy, that it was a calling and that it was, uh, you know, it was like a religious thing uh, to, to be a physician, that you just were, this is what you were and this is what you were 24 hours a day. You were, you were a physician 24 hours a day. And now I think a lot of people go into healthcare and become physicians and nurses knowing that, you know, yeah, I'll be a physician from nine to five, but that after five o'clock, I want to go play volleyball with my counterparts that, you know, or the mechanical engineers and stuff or the IT techs, uh, you know, I mean, they want to have a life, you know, so it's a very different thing. And this has all happened during my span of my career. I've seen it change. So the author uh, goes on, you know, and again, this is about doctors aren't burned out from overwork. We're demoralized by our health system. OK. Uh, the, he talks about inequalities in the standard of care available to rich and poor Americans. I mean, that could be debated. I mean, again, I work in a system where we're taking care of poor people all the time, and I think that they get pretty darn good care. Uh, they probably get a bill, but they probably never see the bill because I, I think probably we know that they're not going to pay it. And so who pays that bill? The people who have health insurance are paying that bill. So he, he kind of goes back to the the pandemic here. Um, it gets a little dramatic, and this, this is always irritating to me. Uh, bodies were stacked in makeshift morgues. Many healthcare workers traumatized by recurrent waves of death. I've said this in other videos, and I probably taking those videos off of YouTube because no, nobody cares. But my experience during COVID was we saw some sick people, but for the most part, during most of COVID, the, the hospital was empty. The emergency department was empty. People were staying home. Then people started coming in, and yes, we got some very sick people, uh, but you know what? We get very sick people all the time. Every year we get really sick people. And I worked during the flu pandemic, the H1N1 pandemic, which was in, I think, uh, what was that, 2007, 2008, somewhere around there. Um, and, and by the way, we didn't wear masks. We didn't wear gowns. We didn't wear gloves. We didn't have positive pressure rooms. We didn't have any of that stuff. We just walked up to them and said, oh, you got the flu. Hope you feel better. And, uh, you know, with their 104 temp, um, they were pretty sick. But anyway, uh, times are very different right now. But my point is, uh, we saw in the news, we saw, you know, Burger King refrigerated trucks parked outside of hospitals that were supposedly being filled up with bodies. It's probably true, probably happened somewhere, probably happened a few places. But that was not the case everywhere, which is what the media wanted you to think, is that that was happening in every single emergency department and hospital throughout the country, that we were just so overwhelmed that we were, you know, standing in the hallways crying and all this kind of stuff, which uh, that that annoys me big time. Um, it, it just was not the case. Um, he says that one fifth of physicians report knowing a colleague who had considered attempted or died by suicide during the first year of the pandemic. I think that that's the case pretty much all the time. I, I Unfortunately, there's a very, very high suicide rate amongst Physicians, nurses, dentists. I heard the dentists are, are the highest as far as suicide rate. Uh, I've known more than a few nurses who have uh, committed suicide. And uh, the, these were nurses that worked in the emergency department with me. And in, in almost every case, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know what, what it was. I mean, there were certainly, uh, they were, they didn't show any signs beyond anybody else, but uh, that is, uh, unfortunately, that's true. So according to the author, uh, nonprofit hospitals have uh, saddled the poor with debt, exploited tax incentives meant to promote care for the poor, um, and instead turned large profits. So here comes the, the point that really struck me. 
Hospitals are deliberately understaffing themselves and undercutting patient care while sitting on billions of dollars in cash reserves. Now, I don't have any data to support whether they're sitting on billions of dollars in cash reserves. I, I mean, I think if you talk to any hospital administrator, they're going to refute that, that they don't have billions of dollars. But let's be honest. I, I think what we've learned over the last few years is that we can't believe anything. We can't believe anything anybody says. You can't believe anything that a hospital administrator says. And you probably have a hard time believing anything that a politician says. So, you know, who knows? Here's the thing that I do know is that the uh, latest statistic that I saw uh, from the Hospital Association is that nationwide there's somewhere around 30,000 hospital beds that are closed that were open before the pandemic, but they're closed now. And what does that mean by closed? It means that they're still physically there. I mean, there's still a bed and, you know, there's bed sheets and, you know, the, the, the bed is sitting there. But the claim is that there isn't a nurse to staff that bed and there isn't a housekeeper to clean the bed. That's that's the story. And, and the, the question there is, well, why? Well, again, I think nurses left in in droves to go to other places to work where they could. Uh, get a little bit better work-life balance, uh, maybe earn a better income, not have as much stress, not work nights, not work weekends, holidays, all that kind of thing. So I think we lost a lot of nurses in that regard. But we lost them, and there's been really no effort to, to replace them. And, and more than a few were fired because they wouldn't get the COVID shot. And there has been no... Uh, no effort to, to try to recapture those people and try to bring them back and apologize or whatever. So the result is you have understaffed hospitals. You have beds that are closed, which means when you come into the emergency department and we determine that you need to stay in the hospital, I'll admit you to the hospital, but I don't have a place to put you upstairs. And so you're going to stay in the emergency department. What happens then? Well, that bed is occupied by you which means that the next person that's out in the waiting room, I can't bring them back because I don't have a physical space to evaluate them. I mean, in, in, unless you want to call the hallway a, a physical space, and we use the hallway. I mean, if, if, if any of you have been to an emergency department, you can see that, you know, we utilize hallways to the point where we need bigger hallways. Maybe that's the answer to the healthcare problem is that we just need bigger hallways. But that's where we're doing a lot of patient care. And, and, you know, obviously inappropriately, right? I mean, you can't really do much of a physical exam with any sort of privacy in the hallway. Despite how many screens you try to put up around the bed, you know, that ultimately get knocked over or whatever. Uh, so you've got a crisis of people that are sitting in the emergency department. We call them borders. They're boarding in the emergency department. That means that the hospital is just getting stacked up in the waiting room. People are waiting out in their cars, waiting to be called to come in. I mean, it's ridiculous. And you would think that hospital administration would look at that and say, well, you know, the ER is uh, our front door. It's, it's, it's where most people experience the hospital for the first time as they come in through the emergency department and then they get admitted. You would think there would be a, a pretty strong desire to address that. And, okay, you know, for the first few months, pandemic, blah, 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 give them a break. They're, they're dealing with a lot of other issues. But, you know, we're pretty much past all of that. There's no effort to fix this whatsoever no movement, no discussion. It's just okay. It's just the new normal to have, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 people in the waiting room or more. I mean, last week, uh, I think it was on a Tuesday night, we had 100 people, 100 people sitting in the emergency department waiting room. Our, our waiting room can't hold 100 people. So they were all sitting outside. It was, you know, 10 degrees outside. Yeah, I mean, this is ridiculous, but this is the system that we have right now. And I think that there's something afoot that is keeping hospitals from really addressing the problem. 
how do you address the problem? Let's just talk about that for a second, okay? You've got a problem where you've got the ER backing up. You've got waiting rooms that are filled. Well, I mean, you could build bigger ERs, right? But that takes a few years, so you can't do that right away. So bring in some trailers, you know? I, I mean, I can remember way back where we had uh, residents, they were sleeping in trailers out in the parking lot in order to open up space to see patients up in, in the floors that the residents used to sleep in, uh, the physician residents, you know? So they could do that. They could bring in trailers. Um, they could actually, you know, incentivize nurses and NPs and PAs and physicians to actually uh, come to work and maybe, you know, refrain from sending billions of dollars to every other foreign country and instead you know, keep some money here in our system. That's just my thought. So uh, the author uh, gets, you know, a little bit more political here that uh, physicians have long fought socialized medicine, fearing it would undermine their autonomy and make less money and affect their elite status. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, uh, the author uh, goes on to say that he counsels patients on the risks of diseases such as obesity, diabetes, and heart disease while ignoring the economic inequities that cause such disease. You know, and, and I get what he's saying. He's saying that, you know, in the inner city area, uh, people are more likely to eat fast food. They're more likely to smoke. They're less likely to exercise uh, on and on. And that's going to lead to uh, these risk factors that he's talking about, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, all that sort of thing. And, uh, and yeah, that's all true. That's all true. Uh, can you fix it? That's That's the... That's the big question is, you know, can you fix it? And and how do you fix it? If you guys got any suggestions, I'd love to see it in the comments, okay? Um, he goes on to criticize the AMA for developing the ICD codes. These are the diagnosis codes uh, that the AMA, that's the American Medical Association, they created the codes, they own the rights to the codes. How bizarre that is. Um, but what it's done, uh, these, these codes, I mean, if you come in with a sore throat, I mean, I diagnose you with, you know, a sore throat. Uh, but there's a specific code that goes along with that. And that code goes to the billing department that determines uh, in, in some part uh, what we bill for that service. And then it's also for data keeping, too. I mean, if somebody wants to go back and see how many sore throats we saw in 2020, they can look up that diagnosis code and the computer will spit out how many sore throats under that diagnosis code were seen. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's all for statistics, but all it's done is just create a cottage industry in um, coders and administrators. I mean, we have, uh, we basically have like one coder, that's a full-time position, one coder for every two or three providers in the emergency department, uh, just to look at our chart, Make sure that we've included the right verbiage in order to bill for the right codes. And, uh, you know, even though we have a you know billion dollar uh, computerized system, we still need humans to code these charts, to make sure that I put in all the right stuff so that we can send out a bill and actually get paid for it. Because the health insurance company is always looking for a reason to not pay you. And so that's typically what happens is... Uh, you know, they'll see sore throat, but well, but he didn't uh, uh, put it on the record how long the person has had a sore throat or, you know, were there any white patches on the tonsils or whatever. I mean, you know, if you forget one or two things or whatever, uh, then they, they deny paying for it at all. That's it's part of the game. Huge game. So the author goes on to say, we can no longer be passive witnesses. We need to use our collective power to insist on changes. Just just using the term collective makes me a little bit nervous. But uh, he goes on to then uh, kind of expose himself a little bit more. He wants to take steps to unionize. He thinks that all physicians should be unionized. Uh, that way, if all physicians are unionized, we can demand universal health care through civil disobedience via physicians' control over health care documentation and billing. So that's where it gets a little scary. This is where he's kind of, you know, at the end, he's is where he's exposing himself that, 
you know, we should all rise up as one and, you know, encourage civil disobedience, uh, whatever that would look like. I, I don't know. But uh, until doctors join together to call for reorganization of health care, the system will remain broken. <clears throat> so that may be true. But here's the thing. I'll, I'll say this and then, and then I'll stop. But insurance companies, the executives of insurance companies, most of them are physicians. When you uh, do a malpractice case, and I mean, I've I, I reviewed a lot of malpractice cases because, you know, you can make some money on the side by doing that. But here's the thing. If you are an expert witness, uh, you know, you are perpetuating the malpractice industry. If, if all physicians just basically said, I'm not going to be an expert witness, I'm going to stay away from it, I'm not going to engage in it whatsoever, I think you'd see a big shakeup in the malpractice industry. <laughs> but you always have physicians that are willing to testify against another physician, even even if they're doing it disingenuously, it, it happens. So whether you want to call that corruption in the system or not, I don't know. But um, that is where we're at. It's a messed up system. I don't know what the answers are. I mean, I can, I can give you opinions, but I'm not in charge. And all I know is that uh, when I go into work again on Monday, I'll be seeing patients that have been sitting in the waiting room uh, since 10 or 11 o'clock the evening before. So when I start my shift at 7 a.m., I'll be seeing people that have already been there all night. And some of them don't mind, you know, they just sleep through. But then there's some people that are legitimately sick, you know, people that remind me of my mother or my grandmother that has suffered in the in the waiting room all night and and why i mean we have beds available upstairs we don't have nurses fix that problem first hire the housekeepers uh put the money where it needs to be and don't even get me started on the cost of health care because nobody knows what the cost of health care is nobody knows you hear politicians say i want to cut the cost of health care i want to reduce the cost of health care well nobody knows what health care costs I mean, you can't tell me that a Tylenol costs 25 bucks, but if you get a Tylenol in the hospital, you look at your bill when you're discharged, you're going to be paying $25 for a Tylenol. Well, you know it's not $25. You can go to the dollar store and get 500 of them for a dollar. So uh, there's, there's just so much that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, I've got some other articles that I want to talk about, but... We'll leave it at this one for now. Hope you have a good day. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.